So welcome everybody to Where Work Meets Life. Uh, this is part two of an interview with Dr. Nina Brown, um, author of Working with the Self-Absorbed and many, many other books um, on the topic of narcissism as well as group therapy. And thank you for being back today to talk about healthy to destructive, exploring narcissism in ourselves and others. So Dr. N yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's my pleasure. Now I want to dive a little bit more today into this topic of how there's healthy narcissism and it's a continuum of healthy adult narcissism all the way to destructive narcissistic um, personality and behaviors. Um, so obviously all of us um, have, have some of this in us and to have healthy self-esteem means that we do have some, some elements of, of narcissism. So can you shed a little bit more light on that continuum um, and what aspects might help us in our career around healthy narcissism? Well, um, Kohu in his book on the restoration of the self defined healthy adult narcissism as having empathy, uh, creativity, wisdom, zest for life and what you're doing, an appreciation of beauty and wonder, and an appropriate sense of humor. It's interesting that he emphasized an appropriate sense of humor, which I've come to understand what he means. And so this is how we can develop ourselves, particularly with the empathy, because one of the defining characteristics of someone with a narcissistic personality disorder is a lack of empathy. Um, and so what we can work with is developing our inner selves so that we can be empathic, that we can feel what the other person is feeling without losing the sense of ourselves as being separate and distinct from them. We don't become enmeshed. We don't become overwhelmed. And we're also not rigid where we don't even try to empathize with anyone else. And so that those are some of the ways that we can work to develop ourselves to ensure that maybe the narcissism that we have, the self-esteem that we have is healthy. I I love that. I think empathy, hands down, is, is one of the most important, you know, traits or behaviors that or emotions or what however you want to call it, being empathetic um, is, is something that is, is so key. Um, but but what I'm hearing is some people lack it, um, uh, of course. And do you think it can be developed in people that lack it, especially those with narcissistic personality traits, Nina? I like to be of the mindset that anybody can change. And so if they don't have it, they, they can get it. I'm also discouraged by the little bit that I read in the literature that um, if they have a diagnosed personality disorder like narcissism, I haven't seen much in the literature that would lead me to believe that they do develop it. It's not because it can't, because I think everyone is capable of changing. They just don't. They see no need to. They don't see that they don't have empathy. They have the words, but they don't have the meaning. They tend to dismiss others' feelings or, or are indifferent to others' feelings. Um, and it's work for them. So they don't see any need to change it. I can definitely see that. Here's a, a simple question. Uh, what percentage of narcissistic personalities see themselves as having narcissism or destructive narcissism? <laughs> I think I could probably safely say none. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> or diversity. You know, some might give some tactical acceptance of it, but I don't think they really believe it. Because if you believe it, they change. 
so um, in terms of people who are diagnosed with the NPD, that's a very small percentage of people, very small. Uh, but I think that there's a larger pool of people who have not been diagnosed or people who would have what I termed the destructive narcissistic pattern of behaviors and attitudes where they're fewer and less intense than the NPD, but nevertheless, they still have behaviors and attitudes that are troubling to their relationships. So in terms of numbers, I can't give you that. <laughs> it's just out there. And I really resonated with what you said about humor, because what I've noticed with, with some of these types of um, individuals is They'll make a joke, but it's a mean or a cruel joke or a dig, right? Or a dig. And then, oh, I was just joking, right? Or, oh, it's just, you know, I'm just being, you know, funny, but it's really hurtful. Um, so that's a pattern, right? Yeah, it's really hurtful. They use sarcasm, taunting, and teasing. And if you were to protest, it would be, what's the matter? You can't take a joke? When indeed, as you pointed out, it's not funny at all. It's really very hurtful. And then the the implication is, or they will say, you're being overly sensitive. You're making too much of it. So it all gets turned back up to you, that you are inadequate because you don't see the humor. And they see the humor. And so, I, yeah. I see a lot of that around and people don't even think about it, that what they're saying may be hurtful to somebody else. It sounds funny to me. No, it's not funny. Completely. Yeah, I can I can totally relate to that. Um, what are your top uh, recommendations for um, dealing with someone who does show narcissistic personality, destructive narcissistic personality patterns in the workplace. So it, the damage that they can do, what, what would you do about that if, if you were leading an organization and you saw this? If I, if I were leading an organization, I guess the first thing I would do, or what I would try to do is to listen to everyone. And then realize that all I'm hearing is one side. The other thing is that I may be perceiving the person that they're talking about differently than they do. Because they do present to people they consider higher in status very differently than they do to people they consider equal or below them in status. So when you go to the boss, they always say to try to make the boss aware of um, what somebody is doing that is hurtful or destructive. Uh, the boss doesn't see it because that person doesn't do any of those things with the boss. And if you, <laughs> if I were in charge, I would like to think I would listen to all sides. But I would also set some very, um, let's say, rigid rules for behavior that might take care of some of it. I would also encourage um, workers to, let's say, uh, get coaching, counseling to help them deal with some of the negative feelings that they may have. Um, I would like to institute a program of rewards and recognitions to show appreciation. I know there's a lot of that out there in the work, work world today, but it, it's amazing how just some indication of recognition of effort and appreciation for the work that somebody does it's amazing how much it means to them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I always say to the leaders that I work with in, in, in organizations, it's, it's the appreciation and thanks and gratitude 
that goes a long way. And the funny thing is it doesn't have to cost anything. It does not. And, and while money is always appreciated, or some material objects are always appreciated, sometimes just knowing that you're recognized and that your work is recognized and that your work is appreciated is is really, really fulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to the narcissist, the destructive narcissistic personalities and behaviors, do they tend not to show appreciation or gratitude for others? I'm, I'm guessing like from what and you've it, seen. Yeah. And even when they do show the appreciation, you can tell it's very shallow. There's, there's no heartfelt meaning behind it. I'm parroting the words because this is what I have been taught that I should do as a leader. So it's, it's, there's no sincerity behind it. And that's the other thing is, as a boss, I'd like to think that I was sincere and that people working with me knew that I was sincere. They trusted me and they believed me. Uh, you can't say that about all bosses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I would also argue that these people can put on different faces for different audiences. So they can show more praise to people that they're trying to impress, right? Yes. <laughs> we call those the suck ups. <laughs> <laughs> we call it managing up to <laughs> no, managing up. Um, yeah, interesting. So how can people follow you? as someone who has lots of wisdom to offer in the world and how they can learn from you about navigating narcissism in work and life, Nina. Well, I'd like, I'd like to think that one of the things that maybe they could do is to take a look at themselves and blame others, including the person who has the behaviors and attitudes that are troubling. And not blame them for how they're feeling. Not blame somebody else for your feelings. To assume responsibility for your feelings, but then to examine where might these be coming from? Why would I feel inadequate? Because that person said something that seemed to indicate that I wasn't adequate. You know, you could ask yourself, how valid was that put down? Well, if it wasn't valid, why is it bothering you? And you just keep delving into what might be at the root of my feelings of frustration, of feeling inadequate, of being shamed, whatever those feelings are, to examine your own feelings instead of Oh, that's the way that person is. What that person's doing and saying is what's making me feel this way. A big part of why you're feeling as you do is up to you. That is brilliant. You've just turned it turned it back <laughs> on us. <laughs> no wonder you are a distinguished fellow of the American Group Psychotherapy Association and a fellow of the American Psychological Association. <laughs> you have really, you know, done justice to our field. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> they uh, were very kind when they gave me those awards. And I do appreciate them. And to the audience, though, though that's a big deal. If you're not in the field, you may not know that, but it's it's a big deal. Dr. Nina Brown is the real deal. And uh, I would say a wise uh, influencer in our field. And when I asked how we could follow you, um, you turned it back on what we can do for ourselves, right? But I think one of the things we can do is to read your books. So in, in terms of the best type of book to start with, um, the, the basics, or like, what, what would you recommend from your literature? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's put it this way. If you like working with the self-absorbed, but you want to know more, then you might want to look at um, 
the book that I wrote on destructive narcissism or the DMP. And the subsequent books that came out of that, because it gives you a little bit more of the background. The newest book on understanding the narcissist really also continues to delve into helping you understand yourself and the reactions you're having to the person that you're terming a narcissist. And to me, that has been more rewarding to know myself and to understand where my reactions and feelings are coming from and then what to do about those and how to moderate those. Um, that's been much more helpful than trying to understand why that person behaves as they do. Um, you know, I could study them for a lifetime and still not understand why they behave as they do. They, so I just accept that this is the way they are. And I can't change them. There's usually a very complex and difficult childhood uh, behind it, behind their behavior, right? And even generations of, of challenges, possibly, right? Um, but yeah, I agree. Your approach is more about what we can do to understand ourselves, gain self-awareness, and then protect ourselves <laughs> and move forward, right? We're not going to change them. No. You know, you could also ask yourself, what would frost the more for you to continue to be frustrated or for you to thrive and survive? That's what I call positive revenge. I'll do better. <laughs> I love that positive revenge. You know, there's no revenge better than a life well lived. That's right. And a career well, you know, versed. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Um, here's an interesting question I ask all my guests. What would you do if you didn't need to sleep and you could use that extra time to do whatever else you wanted? See, what would I do if I didn't need to sleep and I could, you know, you're asking the wrong person is probably something else I would do. But one of the things that I've learned to do is to refresh myself, take care of myself. You see all these books behind me? Mm -hmm. those, are all, those are all mystery books. There are no professional books there. And this is only one wall of books that I keep so that I read mysteries and science fiction. And I try to do that, if not every day, practically every day. I've developed uh, creative activities for group therapy. So I get to practice my crafts for that. That also is enriching. I have family and we do things. And so if I didn't have to sleep, what would I do? I don't know that I'd write anymore. I don't know that I'd read anymore. I don't know that I do crafts anymore. Maybe, just maybe. I might exercise more. <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm doing a lot of what I really want to do. That, that's wonderful to hear. And I can just tell you love writing. I can just tell that you're in a state of flow. We call it career flow when you are writing. Am I correct in that assumption? Yeah. Yeah. It just, it just comes. Um. I wrote my first book because I needed it to get promoted. <laughs> tenure, right? <laughs> Ten no, I had tenure. I went to oh, be promoted did. to full professor. Okay. And I've been very lucky with publishers. And I get I had to, I have gotten rejected or an idea rejected or proposal rejected, but not many. And so I've been very lucky that way. And so yeah, I do like writing. I like writing a lot. I can tell. And the published, I would reframe that. The publisher is lucky to have you. <laughs> you <laughs> you've written so many and produced so many that are palatable to such a wide audience. Um, well, thanks. Yeah. And yeah. So Alanis Morissette's podcast you were on, she, she's a big deal in the music world, or she was definitely, you know, during my 
20s. <laughs> and so, you know, I think you have a wide reach uh, in the world. Okay. Of um, but you're humble. You're very, very humble, um, which is a trait I really admire. <laughs> Well, I've been lucky, and so I won't. I, I won't go too far because I do recognize I've been lucky, and other people have contributed, and yeah, so it hasn't been just me. And yeah, it it resonates. I mean, as someone who's growing my following as a podcaster, and I, I really want to be an influencer so I can help more people reach more people. But there's a degree of healthy narcissism in that, right? And I have to just be yes. careful that I I don't let my ego get in the way as I do grow as an influencer. Mm -hmm. I want to keep the balance that, that you seem to have. Yeah. Keeping a balance can be a challenge at times. And at at times I ask myself, okay, (laughs) have you overcommitted yourself, which is an indication of some grandiosity that I can do everything and I can do it well. And so I back away and try to be more realistic. So it's a lot of self-reflection. And and you have to ask yourself, was I as empathic as I could have been? Or as somebody needed me to be? So, you you know, you never stop growing. Yeah. And I'm trying to do more and more of that and just to uh, see when my ego is getting in the way. Um, And it it, it does very much. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it very much can. So ah, I just, um, I, I think you're wonderful. You've inspired me to write more. I wrote two psychological thrillers in addition oh, to great. all of my nonfiction work. So like you, I've written a lot in the academic world and the business world, but I wrote two psychological thrillers, uh, Losing Cadence and Finding Sophie, you know, a, a number of years ago. And my dream is to get them into a series um, on Netflix or Prime. And I have a film producer, but, you know, I'm, I'm working towards that happening, but I want to write more books. I have more ideas. And so I just think it's a state of flow for me. And I, I haven't built enough time to do that in my life. Well, guess who's in charge of your life? <laughs> you know, uh, I can remember that sometimes my writing because of everything that I had to do I had to take a I had I didn't drop it I just made sure I wrote whatever I could every day whether it was a sentence or a paragraph or what or just some ideas and I think that that kept, kept me focused okay so not the pressure of too much just something every day and then it just grew some- in to more right mm-hmm. More and more, I bet. Yeah, because if I sat around waiting for a block of time to be free <laughs> to write, uh, I, I wouldn't have anything. <laughs> you wouldn't have, what, 30, 40? It's 40 <laughs> books, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. I, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. I the need number's to getting too high to count, okay? <laughs> See, um, it, final I question. Keep... Sorry? I was just saying after two, maybe we shouldn't count. (laughs) Uh, If you could have one wish for a better world when it comes to, you know, destructive narcissism and healthy narcissism in in our lives, what would it be? That people would give their children the care, concern, and empathy they need to grow. Wow, that is so well put. We're going to pull out that quote, put that quote beside Dr. Nina Brown. So thank you so much for being here today. You've shed so much light and you've helped me so much. But I think through our conversation, you're going to help a lot of people out there. Um, And I know myself, you know, a lot of leaders I work with and corporate clients, organizations. Wow, they need to hear this (laughs) because this is a prevalent challenge. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And you continue. Good luck. You're doing great work. Oh, 
Well, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. And if people like this episode, please share it with others who may benefit. Um, go to my website, drlaura.live. I have a monthly e-newsletter where I write an article on each episode and I share resources, tips, strategies that I hope are useful to make the world of work and life better. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today on Where Work Meets Life. I'm passionate about sharing insights from experts around the world on topics at the intersection of where work meets life. If you found this podcast useful, please share with others who may benefit and engage with us on social media. For more articles, information, and tips, sign up for my monthly newsletter at my website, drlaura.live. This podcast summary contains links to the psychology practice I founded, Work Evolution, Canada Career Counseling, and Synthesis Psychology, as well as my current employer, Humans, a nationwide organizational psychology firm focusing on culture and performance. Stay well.